So um, unbelievably enough, we only have two additional speakers for the day. Um, so the next up is Dr. Razik, who comes to us from Canada with the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And Dr. Razik has become a friend to the EHE community, and we appreciate his participation in EHE research. Dr. Razik will report today on a Plato study, and please welcome me um, in joining Dr. Razik to the talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for this meeting, to, uh, to uh, as you guys uh, has invited me. Um, it's, very, uh, it's a humbling experience being in uh, within all the EHE researchers. Um, the purpose of this uh, talk today was to actually present to you a trial in progress called the PLATO study. Unfortunately, with the problems with COVID, this is still work in progress, but I would like to share this idea with you, especially with the patient as well as the academic community. And any um, questions, criticisms, comments, however critical they are, are, are fully welcome. So the PLATO study stands for an acronym for a pilot study of a longitudinal analysis for circulating tumor cells in angiogenic sarcomas, of which we have a cohort of EHE patients. So as a matter of introduction, um, I, I would like to talk about a bit about the challenges uh, treating this disease in the metastatic set setting. I would like to talk about liquid biopsy and a particular system called the parasitic system. Uh, I will then introduce you the concept of the PLATO study, which is still um, in, in, in development stage, and I will take any questions after that. So, um, as we well know, in the advanced and metastatic setting, EHE remains notoriously difficult to treat. Um, standard sarcoma chemotherapy that we use does not work all that well and is best described as modest in terms of efficacy. Um, and in fact, most of our treatment and best practices are based on retrospective series. Uh, there are two published phase two studies uh, in this space. Uh, I'm aware of some that is ongoing, but it, literally this is based on a small collection of literature. Uh, indeed, as uh, highlighted by, by many of the presenters before me, and I'm sure after me, there are positive knowledge in many key aspects of this disease. In the last 10 years, we have seen a lot of uh, new knowledge being acquired. Many of them are significant for understanding this disease and therapeutics. And I, I applaud the researchers as well as the advo uh, advocating bodies for this disease. One of the areas that is really coming uh, of interest is the utility of liquid biopsy technology, either you know, by blood or plasma. And th this is actually a tool that has been demonstrated to be uh, of use in many cancers. And there are many different ways that we can use liquid biopsy. One of them is to capture circulating tumor cells. And this is something that I will reiterate in a little while. Uh, and however, the utilities in sarcoma or EHE is not clearly defined. There are a number of projects, there are a number of studies that are ongoing. Some of them have had early reports, um, including from our institution. So talking about liquid biopsies uh, as it pertains to CTCs, um, high CTC uh, numbers um, has been seen uh, to be associated with adverse prognosis in metastatic cancer patients. And this is a well-known phenomenon. Um, high mesenchymal uh, denoted by M, um, circulating tumor cells are found in many cancers as well as sarcoma. And paradoxically, there, there exists an epithelial mesenchymal transition as well. Uh, and the irony of it uh, in sarcomas is not lost um, on me. Um, in terms of CTC use, because these are blood sampling, we can really look at it over uh, a, a period of time. So instead of having one sample, uh, we can have multiple samples over time, which can give us quite a, a, a better understanding of what happens in patients in terms of genomic or proteinomic changes. Um, because of this um, utility, if you like, uh, this is something that is of interest to us. 
Now, the parasitic cell separation system is a semi-automatic system. They capture circulating tumor cells from bodily fluids, and in this case, it's blood. Uh, blood is put through a graduated stepwise cassette using a pressure gradient, and it captures the circulating tumor cells. And those tumor cells are then enumerated uh, via immunofluorescence. There are multiplex studies that we can done either genomically or uh, proteonomically. So this video is a video of the parasitic system where you, you have got blood flow against this cassette that is graduated and it captures the cancer cells. Now, why did we think of the Plato study. So my involvement in AHE is really spurred by clear advocates of this disease uh, within Canada. And uh, at, you know, just to put into perspective, I wear two hats within my institution. I treat sarcoma patients, including AHE, of course, but I'm also part of five physicians who develop new drugs uh, within our institution. In fact, our phase one program, um, you know, is, is a host for about 60 to 70 different studies at one point or another. And given the lack of treatment uh, efficacy in many of the treatments that we give for EHE patients, many of these EHE patients went um, uh, into phase one studies, if you like. And like many things that are happening, the, 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 the future of cancer seems to depend or weighted quite heavily at the moment on immunotherapy. So when, when, when we first got involved with this disease, we said, you know, we have a number of patients that have been treated with immunotherapy. We don't really understand the immunophenotype of this disease. So that was project number one that we did. And what we had was a sample of, you know, a series of uh, um, uh, EHE patients, some of which are treated with immunotherapy, and we look at their immunophenotype. So first and foremost, are they, in, are they inflamed tumors? Um, you know, things like we look at, at things like CD4, CD8 counts, and so forth. Uh, and also, we look at PDL1 expression as well as um, uh, tumor mutational burden. And that study uh, we have reported at, at, at CTOS, um, so, you know, shows that. First and foremost, like what has been presented before, this is not a disease that has got a high mutational burden, which is not uh, really hugely surprising. We do see some signatures, especially with CDK N2A and N2B signatures uh, as additional mutations, the relevance of which is not really clear to us. Uh, this tumor is generally cold, meaning they don't have tumor infiltrates tumor inflammatory infiltrates and they don't generally um, express pdl1 expression so this uh, has caused a pause to us we said you know what we should take a step step back this is not actually a a, a route that we want to pursue you know we, we did a, a scan of the literature and many of um, your papers that have been published as, as a subject to, to our literature search and we said one of the things that we really don't understand is that the temporal heterogeneity uh, of 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 this tumor i.e what happens to these tumors in patients over time so we thought this was an area that we can bring value on top of what has been studied uh, so therefore we did a plateau study the plato study actually is a a a, a, a longitudinal biobanking study that involves patients with angiogenic sarcomas. Uh, we aim to recruit 10 EHE patients, and I'm glad to say we have got about six people that are uh, already identified as potentially um, uh, eligible for this study. And uh, we, are, we also recognize um, the, the, uh, in EHE, perhaps the journey of, of, of the disease is uh, different to other angiogenic tumors, and many of these patients may end up with watchful waiting or some of them would undergo treatment uh, after a period of time, and we will uh, try and encompass those. And, you know, in this study, bloods will be processed through the parasitic system and then subjected to an array of investigations. So uh, the study has got three different aims at this uh, time point. We have got the first aim is to, to demonstrate that this that it is feasible to detect CTCs in advance or metastatic angio, uh, angiogenic tumors, of which 10 of them would be EHEs. We have used a criteria of a CTC of three cells per 7.5 mils of blood in 70% of patients to say that this is a positive study. Um, and, and once the CTCs have been uh, collected, if you like, then they are subject to a, a number of tests. 
um, which I'll describe in, briefly in a little while. Uh, so where do we get the number of three cells per 7.5 mils? We actually scoured the literature and we looked at many other different tumors, including uh, um, some preliminary early, early reports of sarcoma patients. And this is actually a very modest estimate. Many of the other tumors report, uh, report a CTC count of six or above in this volume of blood. Because the utility of this platform is unknown in sarcoma, we thought this was actually a more pragmatic approach. We would also like to look at the feasibility of using the combined mesenchymal score uh, at baseline. This is the first blood test that we take. Um, so this is derived from the EMT, the epithelial mesenchymal transition slash mesenchymal CTC score um, uh, combined with uh, the megakaryocyte score. And you know, before any of you says, you know, you you may not see megakaryocytes in these tumors, we have factored that in and we have adjusted the score accordingly. Now this is. Uh, a score that we have taken from other tumor sites that use these types of technology and we wanted to see whether or not the CMS score can be an index for, for disease outcome, rate of progression and so forth. And this leads us to, to our specific AIM-3 where we would like to let, take the parameters that we know from specific AIMs 1 and 2 and correlate it to clinical outcomes. We want to look at tumor growth kinetics, we want to look at overall survival and we want to look possibly at whether or not this disease present in an aggressive fashion or not, i.e., you know, whether they present with serosal disease, they're associated with poor prognostic features and so forth. Moving ahead, this is a steady schema. You have to, uh, I have to apologize because uh, this appears a lot smaller. So basically, we're looking at eligible patients, uh, of which 10 of those will be EHE patients. They must have good performance status and able to give blood uh, serially over a period of time. Uh, on patients who are on watchful waiting, we plan to, to biobank their blood every time they get scans. And at the time of they get treatment uh, for about two lines of therapy. We want to capture the CTCs via the parsotic systems. We want to, to, to make sure that they fulfill the minimal threshold to classify that we can do this. And then the CTC will then be enumerated uh, through, uh, through an immunoassay platform to look at expression of uh, the, the, the EMTs and, and mesenchymal uh, uh, indexes. Uh, we will also look at protein and multiplex gene expression studies. And with regards to the CMS uh, scores, uh, again, we're going to do this only on the first sample that we do. And lastly, we're going to take these two parameters that we parameters that we derive in specific AIM-1 and specific AIM-2 and try to correlate them to the clinical outcomes that I have elucidated earlier. So where are we? Unfortunately, uh, COVID with COVID, there were some delays. Um, where we were at uh, Q3 2020, there was the concept and protocol writing. This is following our understanding of what, uh, what we have from EHE with regards to immunoprofiling. Hence, we pivot and change the, the direction of our research. Uh, in, the, in the last month or so, and uh, up, up to the first quarter, we are actually finalizing the contracts and the protocol. We envisage during quarter two, it, you know, by the latest, we would have regulatory ethics and institutional approval. And we aim to put our first patient on by Q3, Q2 or Q3 2021. So in summary, you know, from a clinical standpoint, EHE remains a heart disease to treat, especially in the metastatic uh, advanced setting. The paucity of knowledge in this disease is staggering, uh, not for lack of effort, obviously, but there is so much to do in this disease space. Uh, what we thought was bringing additional value to work already done in this space was to employ liquid biopsy strategies to understand better the temporal and molecular evolution of this disease. And we're hoping to, to put our first patient on mid-year 2021. Now, a, a lot of this work, like anything else, is dependent on a lot of help. Uh, Angle Biosciences, uh, you know, the people who develop parasitics have been very supportive uh, through this endeavor. Dr. Ayodele, who is my project fellow, originally from Nigeria and uh, trained in Ireland and in Toronto. And of course, uh, the work done by the EHE Foundation uh, 
combined with the Sakoma Cancer Foundation with the clear advocacy of Fiona Ross, who I understand is within the audience. And of course, you know, the, the, the kind donors uh, that, 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 that has, you know, contributed not only money, but also time and samples uh, for the work we've done. Now, again, I recognize my, my scope in EHC research has been very preliminary. And if there are any comments or any suggestions on how we can make this better, um, I would welcome that. The vision is once we have got this pilot study app and running, and if we can deliver this, is to expand this to, to, to a bigger scale, of course. So that's where the collaboration that we talk about across different countries hopefully will come in. Thank you. Right. So uh, first question actually gets to your very last point there, which gets into statistics. Um, you know, looking at uh, people who've worked in this field before with other types of cancer where they're not so rare, uh, it can take many, many samples to get meaningful statistics out, especially if you're looking at um, drug effectiveness prediction, uh, prognosis, things like that. Do you have a feeling for, um, you know, after this initial phase, if things are successful, how many samples you'll need working with outsiders to sort of get meaningful statistics uh, for things like um, you know, drug effectiveness, uh, prognosis, et cetera? So the short answer to that is we're unclear at this point. It depends what we find within our pilot study because that will generate further hypothesis. But one thing to me is very clear, this cannot be done as a standalone project if the results are encouraging because it will need a collaboration across many different institution, institutions in many different countries. And do you have a, do you, and I, I wish I knew this, um, I'm sure other people in the group here already know the answer to this, uh, but uh, do, you have, do you know how much uh, there has been collecting of blood as opposed to tissue so far that's already been banked or expected to be banked in the near future to assist with improving those statistics? So, so uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of uh, systematic um, uh, liquid biopsies or, or, or liquid biobanking in EHE. Um, we, we have a liquid biobank um, effort in Sarcoma within our institutions. It, it at the moment does not include EHE patients because that, that wasn't the focus when that study was started. Now, with this study, it will be included because there is how this will naturally grow. Um, I think the most important thing for us within the study is that, you know, there will be many samples, but we, we want to create a biobank first and foremost. And when we talk about the biobank endeavors that we have, um, we have uh, heard earlier on, I wonder whether liquid biopsies should be included into this. Because at the end of the day, I'm sure for, for, for the people who suffer from this disease, giving blood periodically is not a, a big ask, you know, realizing the, the, the bang for buck that may, can, may come in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, whether part of your initial aims or as part of a follow-on, uh, do you expect to correlate the genetics you're seeing with the circulating tumor cells with uh, what people have been seeing with tumor biopsies or possibly from the same patients uh, doing those sorts of correlations? So within the study, we are um, taking the, the, the archival samples. Some of them we already have because it's part of the initial initiative, but it will be part of it. But the point that you have is that the, the main aim of this is really to find out whether we can do this because, you know, 10 patients at the end of the day is not going to be leaps and bounds. But the question is, can we generate a signal within this small number of patients that is worthwhile to pursue further? I guess that will be the bigger question. Yeah, yeah. Well, and let's talk long term. Uh, let's say this works out and there's access to more samples and the statistics uh, are meaningful. Um, you know, speaking to the patients who are on the on the call here, long term, what would you if if if, if this all works well, uh, what do you foresee as the the clinical product here? What what does this look like for patient care in the future? So so the the. the from my perspective, this is how I'm thinking, and, and I may be wrong, maybe right. So, so we all recognize the 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 um, 
the fusion products that are associated with disease, this disease is actually driving the cancer. And I think the biggest bang for buck is as per, per described earlier on, that if we were going to get a an imatinib in gist type of picture in, in EHE, you know, that is the target that we have to look at. But I think from my perspective is that there is no cancer that I know is stagnant. It means even if you find that the initial impetus, uh, tumors are, are always constantly evolving. So if you understand the evolution, we, we might actually transition uh, and pivot, you know, for people who actually have good treatments beyond that. So I'm trying to, you know, really, I'm not a scientist. I, I, I'm thinking of it from a, an early drug developer clinician hat about what is the next big question. Because the big questions, the you know, the elephant in the room for EHE, we have got a lot of great minds that have been working on it. And, you know, I don't think I could contribute more to that. But my question is beyond that, is there something that we can do to try and accelerate the process? Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing more.